I'm a sports fan for a lot of reasons, including the power of sport to unify people from diverse backgrounds, to give us something to be excited about and to talk about together, no matter who we are, what we do, or where we're from. But in the last couple of years, politics intruded in our pastimes. As an Emmy-winning sports anchor and reporter, this week's guest has a unique perspective on sports and American culture. She's Trenny Kusnerik, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, filmmakers, authors, journalists, and more, to make sense of the big stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Trenny Kuznerik, an Emmy Award-winning sports anchor and reporter for NBC Sports Boston. Trini, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Great so, job on my last name. It can be a mouthful. Well, <laughs> I, I practiced. Um, you know, you've, you've covered so many different elements of sports in your career. We want to talk about that. We also want to talk about some of your other interests as well. But for those of us who might not be familiar with your work, how did you get into broadcasting sports and, and journalism in general? Um, I was always just a really curious kid, and I always was um, sort of pretending to be a reporter, even when I was you know, six, seven, eight years old. My mom loves to tell the story about how I would like, walk around at Easter and interview people, and when camcorders you know, came to be, I would use a camcorder and go around and ask people, you know, do you like your Christmas presents, and do fake you know, weather. Um, casts and whatnot. Um, and as I got older, I just always knew that I wanted to do journalism. Um, I liked telling stories. I liked learning about people and learning about things. But sports sort of came to be in a, a roundabout way. Um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. Um, I'm just on the other side of 40. I'm 41. And so there weren't a lot of women doing sports. Um, and in college, I was watching a football game with a friend of mine, and I was complaining about something the Packers did. I'm a huge Packers fan. I'm from Wisconsin originally. And he said, you know, you should be a sports reporter. They let women do that now. And I was like, huh, that's actually a good idea. And so then I interned in sports. I had already interned in news at the ABC affiliate in Milwaukee. Um, and from there, it just sort of took off. I worked in news for a long time, assignment editing, uh, uh, producing, field producing. Um, my first job was actually half news, half sports reporting. Um, and then once I got my feet under me in sports, it just sort of took off. Well, so we're uh, on the eve of a new NFL season. So for those of us who uh, live and die New England sports, uh, this might not be the best year for your New England Patriots. Well, let's let's talk about <laughs> well, that. So you know, go. Tom Brady's forty-one years old. Uh, how much gas does he have left in the tank? And what's that relationship like between him and Bill Belichick? Uh, I'll start with the first one. Um, as someone who is the same age mm -hmm. as Tom Brady, um, same birth year, I think we have lots of gas left <laughs> in the tank. I think we are still very athletic at forty-one. But, but you're not playing football. But I'm not playing football, and the reality is that we have never seen this before. I mean, yeah. he has done something that no other NFL quarterback has ever done. Um, he takes impeccable care of his body. And I think Bill Belichick, this training camp, has really gone to great lengths. We've made a lot about the fact that early on in training camp with the Patriots, that he hasn't practiced as much, taken as many reps. Maybe it's the fact that he is a little sore and some bumps and bruises that weren't there before. But I think it's also calculated that Bill Belichick knows if he's going to last an entire season and not fade down the stretch a little bit, I know he had 500 yards in the Super Bowl, right. but his December numbers weren't as what we were used to. You know, keep him, keep him fresh, keep that body healthy, keep that body going. As for what his relationship is with Bill Belichick, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. No, they're both cyphers when it comes to Yes, they, they're not exactly about, they don't like to share. No one's braiding hair <laughs> and uh, painting nails and telling us all about their feelings. Um, you know, you have to imagine, though, that it seems strained. It doesn't seem the same way that it was in the past. I think it started last year 
Alex, the whole Alex Guerrero thing, mm -hmm. I think that rubbed Bill Belichick the wrong way. I think that Jimmy Garoppolo having to part ways with him. I, I don't think Tom Brady like marched up to Robert Kraft's office and was like, trade this guy. I don't want him here. But I do think there was some pressure from above. Otherwise, why would Bill Belichick give him away for nothing more than a second round pick? Um, and I, I do think m missing OTAs and taking a step back and doing all these things that are very sort of un-Tom Brady-like, you yeah. know, t uh, Tom versus time and going to the, oh, he's always gone to the Met Gala, but missing, you know, going to Monaco or going to Qatar instead of attending team workouts, that's something he's never done before. And I think Tom Brady has, you know, made a point to say, my life is starting to change. You don't run me anymore. Yeah. I'm just as important to this team as you are. And I think that's caused a little bit of a rift. So before we get into a lot of the political and cultural issues in the NFL and sports in general, one last Patriots question. For those of us in Patriots Nation and the rest of the world that hates Patriots Nation, is he going to bring them back to the Super Bowl? I mean, could he? Absolutely. He's Tom Brady and he's Bill Belichick. I mean, I will never say never. The way this team is currently constituted – I don't know that they get there. I, this is their weakest wide receiving core they've ever had. You, there's so many question marks on defense, and that defense was terrible last year. They got beat by a backup quarterback in Philadelphia. Um, I don't know that they've addressed enough of the issues. With that said, who else right now do you look around the AFC and say that is an absolute challenger to the New England mm, Patriots? Exactly I mean, that. maybe Andrew Luck in Indianapolis. If he's healthy. If he's healthy. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, maybe um, the Houston Texans. Um, Deshaun Watson is back. They've got their quarterback. They've got a defense. So maybe that, maybe Jacksonville, even with Blake Bortles as quarterback. I know he's not a great quarterback, but they have such a stellar defense. Are they a team like the Tampa Bay teams from years ago? Or even the Peyton Manning-led uh, Denver Broncos from a few years ago when Peyton wasn't at his best, but the defense won a title for them. I would say those are probably their biggest challengers. But if you have Tom Brady and he's healthy and you've got Bill Belichick, there's always a chance. There's always a chance. So let's get to the political. Taking a knee. What are the roots of that? Well, it started with Colin Kaepernick. Um, and Colin just felt that um, social justice issues were going unnoticed. And he wanted to find a way. He was upset at the number of black and brown men um, being shot dead by law enforcement. And there, wouldn't, there didn't seem to be any movement to honor these men or change what was happening and have an open dialogue and conversation about why this was happening and why it seemed, at least in our estimation, to be happening at, at, at an uptick. So he took it. At first, he sat. He actually sat down and, and, and didn't kneel. And that was two years ago. Is that correct? Uh, it might have actually been three, three years, years ago. Three years ago. I think ago. it was okay. three years ago now at this point. Um, and one of his teammates was a veteran. And he said, I respect your right to protest. Um, but you know what? Sitting down is really disrespectful. Take a knee. Take a knee is more respectful. And I think a lot of people forget that, that Colin Kaepernick listened to a veteran on his team who supported his right to protest. So he took a knee and it grew into that. But that's, that is the root of it. And Aaron Rodgers, and I'm not just saying this because he's the Packers quarterback, but Aaron <laughs> Rodgers, um, you know, said earlier um, in the summer, just a few weeks ago, he talked about why have we forgotten what this is really about? And, and for me, it was a, a really pivotal moment, a seminal moment, because we haven't had a white quarterback speak out. We haven't had a star white player. other. And Chris Long has been very vocal, yeah. but Chris Long is a defensive end, and he's on the tail end of his career. He is certainly not. If you walk down the street and ask, ask 10 people who's Chris Long and who's Aaron Rodgers, I'm going to say 9.5 out of 10 will know Aaron Rodgers. Maybe 6 out of 10 Patriots fans will remember who Chris Long is. So for Aaron Rodgers to come out and say, this is not about the military. This is not about protesting the anthem. This is not about being anti-police. This is about looking at the injustices that minorities in this country face. And why hasn't it stopped? Why is there no movement from people other than their own small communities to make, it, to make anything change and to make a difference? I, I, one of the things I'm curious about, and I don't, I want to come back to some of this, these, these uh, where sports and society interact, but do you have any doubt that Colin Kaepernick doesn't have a job because of his no. outspoken position no. on this? No. I mean, it seems pretty clear to. You know, you know. some people, they, they, some like to argue, even my own colleagues um, I, I, on my show at NBC Sports Boston like to argue, oh, well, but he wants to be a starter or he wants starter money. Maybe that's, maybe that's the case. Um, but I think you could look around the league and say, well, why couldn't he be a starter still somewhere on a bad team or at the very least fight for a starting spot? Um, to me, it has everything to do with he is toxic and no one wants to touch him because he started this whole thing 
and listen, he made some missteps. You know, the Che Guevara um, T-shirt that he wore, um, the the socks with the police officers as pigs, like that's terrible. That that hurts your message. That mm -hmm. doesn't help it. Yeah. You know, are there is there a section of police officers that have done terrible things and not had to pay the price for it? Absolutely. But the overwhelming number of law enforcement. Uh, and first responders are good men and women who are out there to protect and help you. And when you put a blanket statement out there like that, you hurt the message you're trying to get across. So he's definitely hurt himself, but not to the point of this where he has been, and Eric Reed has been blackballed as well. Eric yeah. Reed is a safety who played with him in San Francisco and as of this taping has yet to, has yet to sign with anybody because he was the one person along with Colin Kaepernick who knelt from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So a lot of fans embrace this, and a lot of people who didn't even follow football or don't follow football or sports in general embrace it. But there was a real backlash by another large group of fans and non-fans who said, you can't do this. Why was there such a vehement reaction to raising one of the critical issues of our time? I mean, honestly, I, yes. I think it's because uh, it's black men. And I think that there is still... Whether it's conscious or subconscious, I think racism is still a real thing in our society. Um, I think there are more people than are willing to admit who think you're lucky that you, a black guy who came from nothing and you grew up in the ghetto and they have all of these preconceived notions about what that means and what that means about your work ethic and your family and who you are and where you came from. You're making millions of dollars while I'm toiling away making twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars in a factory. No, you play for me. You entertain me. Don't you dare disrespect my nation, my country that has given you so much, which is all rooted in in, and we've heard those words used. We've heard those use, yeah. words used by our president. We've heard those words used by, I don't think any other players, but certainly owners that, you know, you've been given this opportunity to which I always respond, well, who gave it to them other than their mother? And, and if, you know, if you believe in God, God, you know, they always talk about God given talent. No one handed you that ability to entertain them and to be athletically superior to someone else. They just took a talent like anybody else, whether you're a welder or a plumber or a doctor or a TV host, and they took that talent and they ran with it. But I think that their racism is still so ingrained in our society that that's what it comes down to. So, you know, so the president has made uh, this a, um, he's, he's amplified the controversy, right? Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the things I love about sports, I lived in Washington, D.C. for almost 20 years. And I can remember, you I was know, about to say, I'm sorry to hear that, but well, it's actually a really great city. Well, it's a great city <laughs> and, and, and the, it is a sports obsessed city too. And uh, so I could get in the back of a taxi cab, and it didn't matter what the background or the nationality of the, of the taxi driver was, we could talk about the NFL, right? right? It, it, there's something about sports that brings people together. The president, though, seems like he's using sports to drive a wedge into the community. And I, I just can't put that in any sort of historical context. I can't imagine, I can't think of an example where that's, well, there's any corollary with that. I mean, again, um, you know, I, I would say is he using sports or is he using black athletes? Because mm -hmm. when, when you look at who he has criticized, did he criticize Aaron Rodgers for speaking out? No. When Eminem released an entire album um, taking him to task in many of his songs, very politically charged, yeah. did he take, did he get on Twitter and take Eminem to task? No, it's LeBron James, it's Don Lemon, it is these, you know, these African-American athletes and those SOBs. It's, that's, that to me is the crux of it, is that he understands that there is a faction of his base, and not everyone, not mm -hmm. everyone who voted, I, you know, not everyone who voted for Trump is racist or mm -hmm. sexist or, you know, has a, a, a nationalism to them. But there is a very vocal, large part of his base that that gets at the root of fears and insecurities. And he uses it. He uses it to his advantage. I am curious if after the midterms, if that can continue. If there is a huge sweeping shift, a cultural shift where they see, okay, this kind of dialogue is actually driving people away from us as, yeah. though, as to towards us, then maybe the narrative changes. But up from now, people ask all the time, like, no matter what the NFL does, do you think it'll change? And I'm like, not before November. Yeah. And I, is it November 4th? Is that the? Uh, is it the, the yeah, after, I'd have yeah. to look. But yeah. I, you know, early first November, Tuesday first November, Tuesday in November. Yeah. After the first Monday, yeah. Right, after this, first That's Tuesday right. after the first Monday That's in November, right. when we all go to the polls and we vote, um, and the midterm elections, I, I am curious how, if at all, that changes the narrative. So do you have a sense of how, though, is this, uh, how does this, play out in locker rooms? I suppose it depends on how, what, 
what is the level of protest? Mm -hmm. um, do a number of athletes protest once the regular season started? You know, first week of preseason, it was pretty minimal. Four or five teams had yeah. guys who actively knelt or, or um, didn't participate or, you know, raised a fist. Um, so I think at some point, even last year, we just we sort of fell into the rhythm of, of, of the football season. I think at some point that just happens. Yeah. Yeah. Networks stop. I mean, networks never broadcast the national anthem until the protest began, and they right. only really did it for one or two weeks. So I really do feel like when someone says, well, I don't want to have to watch football and have this in my face, it's not really in our well, face. And, and I was, it's and more the commentary around well, it. It becomes a, a talking And point. I was just thinking I wanted to clarify, the, the, the protest I don't have any problem with. I'm tired of the faux controversy that is associated with it because it's, I think it's just political manipulation at the end of the day. Yeah. But that's, that's my soapbox moment for the episode. So another issue that's been breaking into the news is the mental health of professional athletes. And, and that's a relatively recent development. And in preparing for the show, we talked about a couple of people. One was Brian Dawkins, former safety for the Philly Eagles, who has recently come out and talked about his own challenges. What were they? What, what did he say and where did he say? Yeah, it was a really poignant moment during his Hall of Fame speech. It was only about, I, for whatever reason, I remember the exact time on the clip. It was one minute and 11 seconds. But to me, Why it was really, that? I don't know. I, you know what? That's ever a good since, memory. Ever <laughs> since I was a kid, I have had sort of a weird thing with numbers and like specifically, like I love multiple numbers. So um, you remember exactly. So yeah, so I remember it was like, I thought, oh wow. I had gotten so many texts about it. I guess I had assumed that a large chunk of his 15 or 20 minute speech was dedicated to this, but it did strike me that such a small portion, just one minute and 11 seconds of his Hall of Fame speech was dedicated to mental health, but it resonated among so many people. So Brian Dawkins, who was inducted, uh, a former safety for the Philadelphia Eagles, inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame, and he took the time to talk about his depression and how he was near suicidal and how he had gone so far as to plan how he could kill himself and do it in a manner that his wife would still get his insurance money, because there are still insurance companies that will not pay out life insurance policies mm -hmm. if you yeah. die from suicide. Uh, and he talked about coming out on the other side and, you, and having his faith be a big part of that, but also his wife and his support system and finding the strength to get help and seek therapy. And um, one day later, Steve Smith Jr., who was a longtime wide receiver in the NFL, probably going to be a Hall of Fame receiver, um, wrote an essay for NFL media coming out and talking about his battle with depression and how he started to notice it when he was in the league. Um, but always looked at it as, at, from a, as at it from a performance perspective. I saw a sports psychologist, and then once he was out of the league, it really hit him that it was more than that. It was an anxiety and a depression that had been there for a long time. I think, as an, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very outspoken mental health advocate. I think it's fantastic um, because not only do not enough people talk about mental health, not enough men talk about mental mm -hmm, health, right. and not enough African American men talk about mental health. Um, I'm not a huge Kanye West. Fan. Um, I like some of his music. Sometimes he's a little out there for me. But I admire the fact that he has embraced his bipolar disorder. He talks about his hospitalizations. He talks about how, you know, he juggles the highs and the lows and how it has made him an artist. And not having a shame or a stigma around talking about this is just part of who I am. And he brought up recently with Jimmy Kimmel, he said, I talk about it because in African-American communities, one, we don't talk about it. There's a stigma around it. But two, you don't have access to help in those communities. And I want to help people get access to help in those communities. And I hope that's the next step for a lot of these athletes. So, so this is, these have been very positive voices. Yeah. And you yourself have been a positive voice. You, you're very open about your own mental health challenges. Talk about that and why. I mean, you're in the same kind of profession in a way as professional athletes where quote unquote, it's not cool to yeah. talk about <laughs> issues like that. I mean, that obviously is changing and thank God it is. But what prompted you to, to be so open? Uh, it was actually the death of an, a of an athlete. Um, in 2012, Junior Seau took his own life. Um, and I, you know, I, it was weird. I don't know. I always go back. I, I don't know why that suicide in particular affected me so much and sort of changed the trajectory. So quick story. I was, I was working on, um, I was being interviewed for a story in, in Milwaukee magazine. I was living at home and working at home at the time. And an author was going to do a feature on me. He was going to talk to my family and old teachers and whatnot. And we had all, we had it all mapped out. And then Junior say I killed himself. And I, again, it was a moment I won't forget. I was actually in the Brewers press box working a, a Milwaukee Brewers game. And I messaged him and I said, hey, can we change the focus of the story? He's, I, I've long dealt with anxiety and depression. I want to talk about that instead. I didn't, I covered Junior maybe for a season or two, maybe interviewed him once or twice. But I think it was because he was 
relatively close to me in age, within five or six years, but a player I had watched as a kid and as an adult and as a professional, that it just hit me really hard. And I thought, what if he would have had someone that he felt like he could trust or talk to? And I, just, I thought, you know what? It's, it's an opportunity for me to use my voice for something good. Um, I've always struggled. I love, I don't want this to come off the wrong way. I love sports. I love talking about sports. I think it's fun. It's a great escape. But I've always felt like, okay, at the end of the day, what am I really doing for like the greater good of the world? And this for me was a way that I thought I could give back in a different way and use up my platform and my job for something more than just, you know, complaining about David Price. So, Which I wasn't doing at the time. At that time, I was well, good complaining for, by about the way, someone good on the for Brewers. You. We, we, need, we need more prominent voices like yours. Yeah, and it's not, it's not easy. I get, a lot of, um, I get a lot of direct messages on Twitter and Instagram. I get a lot of emails, text messages from, from former athletes, fellow broadcasters, who for whatever reason, and the reasons, you know, there's myriad of them, um, ha- struggle with this and feel very comfortable talking to me about it but may not feel comfortable going public. Um, maybe they feel it will affect a contract negotiation. Maybe um, there was a broadcaster once who was in the middle of a divorce and was afraid, you know, it was like, how might this affect everything? Will it affect how often I can see my kids even though they're a little bit more grown up? Well, th- those are realistic and fears. And those are realistic of the fears, yeah. right. Will I, I uh, you know, this, this person was in, the, in between jobs and will I get another job? Will the insurance take me on? Um, and so it's not easy for everyone to talk about it, but I do find that more and more people are talking about it. And when the time is right, they feel more comfortable talking about it, which is great because at the end of the day, it's, it's just like anything else. I mean, if you would die, if you were born with type one diabetes, you wouldn't be afraid to tell someone, Hey, um, you know, I've got to give myself an insulin shot. So, you know, or, Hey, I have a heart condition. I'm going to need to miss the morning because I have to go see my cardiologist. You should be able to say to your employer, Hi, I deal with you know pretty acute anxiety, and I need to go see you know Tuesdays mornings are when I see my therapist. So I'm going to have to come in every other Tuesday a little bit late. That should be the same as any other. No one would ever look at someone who is dealing with any other sort of um, chronic disease and say, "Well, I'm sorry, you can't. You know, it's affecting your work." Amen. I mean, unless you're pregnant, yeah. but that's not, that's a topic for another time. <laughs> <laughs> So we could do like hours and hours. <laughs> let's 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 go back a little bit towards sports, anyways. The um, so you, we, we talked a little bit about the power of sports to unify and divide. As you look yeah. at sort of the landscape that we're in right now, do you expect more division or more unity from from whether it's the NFL or the NBA or the NHL? You know, I still, I mean, maybe I'm too much of a poly positive, but I still think it's a unifying force. Um, I just think, and I was telling Wayne this when we talked on the phone um, leading up to this. By the way, the way I just said phone was so Wisconsin. Was, was every right, once that. in a while it comes out. It's not often, but every once in a while I'll be like, ooh, that was not what my voice coach taught me. Um, when we were talking on the phone, um, I told him I was, I was doing a radio show at Fenway, and there was a guy outside, and he had a Brewer's hat on and a Brewer's um, T-shirt. And I knocked, and I was waving. I was like, Brewer? Yes, because it unites us, right? Like, that's a way for me to look at you. Or if I see someone in a Packers hat, mm-hmm. um, I sometimes I'll just, like, wave or nod. Sometimes I'll literally just pull them aside on the street and just talk, oh, are you from Wisconsin? <laughs> Why are you a Packers fan? But people do it, whether you're from Wisconsin originally, if you're in New England and you're visiting somewhere else, there's always that tie to where you're from, mm. um, whether it's on a, a, a parochial level or I see it, you know, having, the, having had the opportunity to cover the Olympics, just the pride, no matter – What's going on in our nation? People come together around the Olympics. It's like everything else sort of floats to the, to, you know, to the exterior. And I, I t- still contend that sports brings people of all different cultures and backgrounds together. Because like you said, it's something that you don't have to talk. Could you talk about the, the national anthem protest? Could you talk about the unfortunate rash of tweets that have come out in baseball you know, from the past, sure, but you can also just talk about the fact that Mookie Betts and J.D. Martinez are both yeah. having MVP caliber seasons. Yeah. There's always something else there that you can easily slide into a conversation with someone about. That's why I tell women, get into sports. It's such a great conversation starter. Speaking of women in sports, where are women and girls in sports in 2018 in Ooh. America? Wow, that was a good segue. Even <laughs> <laughs> um, We're good at this. Yeah. Um, uh, we certainly are a lot further than when I first started in the industry, um, but not far enough. Um, I think there is still a perception um, that many women who, whether you, if you're an athlete and you're, say, a WNBA player or a soccer player or a hockey player, you're automatically just physically inferior to men. 
Um, are we physically different? Absolutely. Um, are the games played a little bit differently? Sure, but that doesn't make them any less high level or entertaining. But there's still that, again, that sort of stigma ar ar around it. Um, on the flip side, women who work in sports, there's still an idea that, oh, why is she really here? Uh, she's really? just looking That's for it. Lingers. She's still looking for a meal ticket. Um, mm. Does she really know what she's talking about? Would she have this job if she wasn't pretty and thin? She's just here because she's, you know, a hot girl and she doesn't really know what she's talking about. I still feel like young women in the business who are coming up still have to prove themselves twice as much as a man in the business. Where it's changed is I don't see as much, at least I don't see, and it might just be my age also. Um, I'm not exactly like the age that guys are hitting on anymore in the, in the locker rooms and clubhouses, but I do feel like you see less inappropriate actions taking place in a clubhouse. It's not somebody who's dropping a towel in front of you anymore or making lewd comments or being, you know, acting inappropriately because there's too much on the line now. And women, I don't think, are as afraid to say, hey, you can't do that, and if you do it again, I'm, you know, I'm going to upper management about it. Um, so I think that has lessened, but it's still, I mean, the number of people who still, if you go, and I, listen, I know Twitter is its own sort of world, um, but it is a microcosm of society in the way people think. And if you look at mentions for women versus the men, things that people mention about men, it's still vastly, vastly different. They may say, Wayne, I think you stink at your job. But they'll say, Trenny, I think you stink at your job and you're a fat pig and you shouldn't be on TV because you're not pretty enough. That's the difference. It's always tied to, are you pretty enough? Are you womanly enough? Are you enough of what I want a woman to be in order to invade my space? Trenny Kuznarek, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, she's Trenny Kuznarek, NBC Sports and WGBH. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.